Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the 15-minute chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can see this crazy volume that has just come in here after hours. And we're on the 15-minute chart, so you can see it goes back to the 10th. And look at this volume that's come in here. Look at the move. Uh, the bottom tick there was 16.10. We're up to 16.65. 50 cent move. Is the move going to hold? I don't know. Um, you just can't tell anymore what's going on in these markets. You can see that someone knew something, and then right there at 8 o'clock, it just exploded. I mean, that volume is really big, relatively. Now, if we go out to 30 minute, you can see that that is nothing compared to this volume that we had back in here. But this is new for the fairly recent past. Um, what does that mean? I, I can't really tell you. Uh, I actually did this video in anticipation of looking for um, some buys. We're going to look at the buys. So that's why it's a member only. Uh, we're going to look at some silver buys because we're looking for a new low price. But this was a surprise to me. I just happened to switch over to this. Now, does it correspond with anything? Let's get it into the one minute chart and then we can see. You can see right there at uh, 8 o'clock time frame. Let's look at the euro. No, nothing really there in the euro. The yen, nothing to speak of. Um, Swiss franc, we're going to come back to the Swiss franc when we get to the main topic here. Nothing there. Uh, gold, you can see that it actually kind of rallied into that 8 o'clock uh, time frame. So let's just, uh, for comparison purposes, let's go ahead and pull up an overlay here to see what's going on. Because I, I really, I just happened to come across this. I haven't had time to do any analysis. So we'll just go ahead and, and pop the silver spot over the top of it to see what kind of a um, dynamic we have going on here. So with that in view, it kind of looks like silver was playing catch up there. Uh, to the gold and then surpassed it so kind of a wild thing going on here that's just what you see with silver um, it's crazy and the only thing you can really do with these crazy markets is just keep stacking now I wanted to take you over to the Swiss franc US dollar because this is something that I have a position in and I'm going to show you the Jimmy Rogers interview that's related to this because I think it's important information. But uh, we're, we're entering a period of time here where it, it appears to me, my best guess, is that the central bankers, their cohesion is starting to break down and they're kind of like losing their minds. This is not unprecedented. It's happened in the past. And the first article I want to look at here is uh, this Zero Hedge. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is um, one that came out... Uh, Yesterday, and uh, yesterday evening actually, ex-plunge protection team whistleblower, quote, governments control markets, there is no price discovery anymore. And this is an interview with, um, what's her name, uh, I think it was Malmgren, um, let me see here, yeah, Malmgren's book, uh, Pippa Malmgren, she's uh, interviewed on King World News. And uh, so you have to take what she says with a grain of salt because uh, she actually was um, a member, a former member of the U.S. President's Working Group on Financial Markets. So this is an insider. But basically what she says is that uh, all the markets are government controlled. And you got a very interesting video here uh, where this one gentleman comes out and said in the midst of the financial collapse that the uh, it was very clear to him, uh, this is a member update, so I'll go ahead and play the video, it was very clear to him that the plunge protection team was involved. Twice we've had the president's working group, sometimes known as the plunge protection team, step in when it looked like things might get worse. That happened on October 10th and October 28th. Both of those rallies, nearly 100 points in the S&P, 
they are completely the, the product of the president's working group. Hey, Scott, hold and on, hold so on, hold on, Scott. Hold on. You're saying the government stepped in and bought S&Ps in, in, in and the market? I, I am saying that, that the market action on those two days and one or two others has all the hallmarks of the plunge protection team at work. Right, I've the heard this one before, but you're the first one to say it on TV here. Give us what, what you're looking So here's Steve Leisman or Leisman. You can't make this stuff up. The guy's name is Leisman. <laughs> He's a man who lies. Well, this was back during the financial crisis, and uh, now it's pretty much confirmed. We know that the government was intervening. And you can see here the charts. Here's the charts from Zero Hedge. 100 point S&P rallies. Um, that's absolutely unprecedented. You can see that uh, we look at the chart itself here. That uh, this is back, I think the S I thought the low was actually 666, but that might've been the cash market. It doesn't look like that was the price here on the s p but you can see it was down there below 720 and you can see the rally here up to eight past 810 so that's a one day rally that's actually you can see that's actually a five hour rally that put 100 points on the s p so that's the essence of the story on zero hedge i don't think any of us really have any doubts now that we're in government controlled markets so the big question is, what happens when you have government-controlled markets? What is going to be the result? Well, I want to take you back and read to you um, some ancient history now because this book is so old. But again, it's a classic. This is Market Wizards from Jack Schwager. And uh, this is uh, an interview with Jimmy Rogers. This is a guy I have a tremendous amount of respect for. And now I know there's a lot of people who said, that guy's a crook. He was partners with George Soros. You have to understand, I've explained this multiple times, Jimmy Rogers, uh, yes, he did go to Cambridge and he went to the connected universities, but he was primarily a trader and he traded based on fundamentals and made some very, very good calls. Um, yes, his partner was George Soros, but uh, they started the quantum fund and it was Rogers uh, doing the trading and it started with, off with very little money and they just simply made a ton of money because they were always right. And the reason they were always right is because Jimmy Rogers is so smart. So uh, this guy, in my opinion, is not a George Soros. He's not a guy who has to try to bribe his way into positions or talk to insiders or anything like that. He's a guy who looks at markets, he looks at fundamentals, and he decides where things are going to go. And the reason why I'm bringing up this interview is because this is where Rogers talks about intervention by the central banks. And this is very important because um, we've been in a situation now for so long with central bank intervention that it's almost like people don't know anything else. Because really, I think probably you could show that it's been going on since the plunge protection team was put together. And I think uh, that was 1987 after the crash. So we're talking about going on 25 years, more than 25 years here of this plunge protection team manipulating markets. But let's go back and look at this interview with Rogers and what he said about this intervention. So uh, Jack Schwager asked him, any negative dramatic experiences? And he says, August 1971 was a very exciting time. We were long Japan and short America. And one Sunday night, Nixon announced that he was taking America off the gold standard. I didn't even know it had happened. I had been off somewhere on my motorcycle, and I came in Monday morning without having read the papers. That week, the Japanese stock market went down 20%, and the U.S. stock market went up. We were losing heavily on both sides. Did you have to liquidate your positions right off the bat? You can't liquidate at a time like that. Who can you sell to in Japan? Who could you buy from in the US? If you covered your shorts, you made things worse. In a situation like that, you have to figure out whether you're right or wrong. That's very important with silver. You have to figure out, are you right or are you wrong? If there was going to be a major fundamental change forever, the first loss is the best loss. But if fundamentally you are basically correct, 
then you do nothing but sit there and let the market hysteria wash around you. Did you stay with your positions? Yes. So you really had to write out a rather treacherous paper loss. There is no such thing as a paper loss. A paper loss is a very real loss. What was the analysis that gave you the confidence to stay with your positions? Our analysis was that this was not the end of the world. America had simply taken a short-term step and it was not going to solve our country's long-term problems. Did that position actually turn out to be okay? Yes, it turned out fine. The Nixon announcement was just another step in the dissolution of the Bretton Woods Agreement, a 1944 international pact that, among other things, established guidelines for foreign exchange rate stabilization and the decline of America. America was rallying in its own bear market. So you saw it was a cosmetic move that wasn't going to change the trend and you stayed with your position. Right. Is that a general principle when government measures are implemented to counteract a trend you should sell the rally after government action? Absolutely. It should be written down as an axiom that you always invest against the central banks. When the central banks try to prop up a currency, go the other way. Now, I thought he had said, wait for the rally and go the other way. I think he actually said that in other places. So that's Market Wizards. Again, in my opinion, the second most important book about markets behind Jesse Livermore's Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. So what's the import of that? Well, you can see here, you can look at the charts. We have central banks intervening in markets around the world to an unprecedented extent. This has never happened before in the history of the world. And that's because many of the Western countries are now bankrupt. Now we're coming to the point where their central banks are also bankrupt. Now we saw Janet Yellen blink today. You know that I have some calls on the stock market. Those did very good, but uh, this is just short-term paper trading account. Uh, that's just something to play with while I stack silver. But if we pull this out to the long term, we can see that this is actually now this period of time here from the beginning of the Obama presidency to the present, this is central bank intervention. This is central banks buying stocks. That's what we're looking at. We are looking at a market that is central banks using printed money to buy stocks. Now, the question is, if this has been the case since 2009, will we ever be right? Well, I think we will. Eventually, this is going to go down, and it's going to go down hard because you have to ultimately bet against central banks. Now, if you've been betting against the central banks here and taking bear positions in, in this stock market bull run, you have gone to the poorhouse because the direction is one way. Again, now, if you've been stacking paper silver, you uh, can't really stack it, but investing in paper silver, uh, the trend has been one way and that's down. You've lost. But if you're taking a position against the central banks, and that means you are stacking physical silver, we know that the central banks are shorting physical sil shorting paper silver to try to suppress physical silver, and we know that they are pumping up the bond markets and the stock markets. That is what is happening, and ultimately, I believe that Jimmy Rogers ultimately will be correct, even in this scenario. We're going to see reversals in both of these. We're going to see the precious metals go absolutely skyward. They're going to go to the moon. And we're going to see the stock and bond markets completely collapse. That's because if you see the central banks do something, ultimately you have to wait for that rally to end and go the other way. So let's jump back into silver. And because we have such a crazy move going on right now. Uh, but I wanted to look at a, oh, here we go again. You can see we're forming another pennant here in silver, breaking out into new highs at 1670. You have to remember we came from an after-hours position here um, tonight of about 16.30. So big move going on. Don't know what's behind it. We'll probably find out. 
So let's go over to the stacking um, suggestions here. Now, this is something that I came across. I come across a lot of things, but the main ones that I come across are in the Lunar series because that's the one that I stack the most. That's the one that I pay attention to the most. Uh, that's the one that I invest in the most. So that's the one that I follow. And uh, this one started really jumping out at me today because I was looking at this GOAT series. Now, the GOAT series, for a number of reasons, has not been one that I have really liked. And again, I always go by aesthetics, and that's just my opinion. So that doesn't really mean anything. It's served me fairly well in the past. It got me heavily into the tigers, got me heavily into the horses, and we know those those horses have done fairly well. But if you remember the history of the Lunar Series, you'll remember that that dragon was the first year where they exploded that one ounce price. And they I've covered this before. They overestimated the demand. And uh, the secondary people like Atmex and Gainesville and Provident and the others, they overpriced that product and no one was buying it. They had to drop it, drop it, drop it. Uh, you have to remember you have about 300,000 in these one outs. That's the limit. So they made a bet. They bet wrong. Um, I never picked up any of the one ounce uh, dragons. They were just so highly priced. I did pick up the two ounces and did pick up the half ounces. Then the next year, uh, we had them come down a little bit. Um, and then we came down a little bit more with the horses, although... The one ounce horses that I picked up were about 37 bucks. Uh, I've never seen them lower than that, so I haven't bought any more. I think I bought like 20 of them or something like that. Mainly went into the half ounce horses and the two ounce horses. Now, with the GOAT series, we're actually seeing this one ounce coin. It actually got very low. It didn't get super low. And this is the one that I want to show everybody first because um, this is going to be the most important one here is bullion direct now i've never dealt with them so i don't know anything about them but you can see here you've got a one ounce goat at 2374 and you can see that they have 66 left so for me now i'm not going to buy these uh, if i were going to buy them i wouldn't have told you about them but probably that's going to be a deal that someone wants to snap up now i want to show you why i think this is happening the first one we want to look at is Gainesville coins. Now Gainesville coins had had uh, the, on the lunar series I'd been watching them very closely they had had just the current year they ran out of horses they were gone a long time ago and they, all they had were the goats but you can see now at Gainesville uh, these are priced by uh, low price you can see you've got the half ounce here and you jump straight to the half ounce proof and then you go to the two ounce there are no one ounce goats available at Gainesville. So that was a one that kind of raised a red flag for me. Now we have them available over here at Provident. Let's see if we can get a quantity here. Each of these sites is different on the way they do the calculation. So you can see on Provident, there's 302 available and you can get them as cheap as 2671 if you buy 20 or more that's three bucks more than that other price now over here on atmex you've got them 2671 that's that's a pretty big premium over spot that's almost 10 bucks and you've got about 1700 there um, over at jm bullion the cheapest price is 2871 again there's the 2374 ones People probably snap those up. But so now the other thing to notice here, JM Bullion, I've been watching them very closely lately. They seem to be the smaller player in these things. And normally when you have a smaller player, they can be more flexible with their pricing. They can pay more attention to what's going out the door and how they can change their prices. Big shops like Atmex and Gaines, they don't have the time to mess with that. They, there's just too many employees. There's too much product. There's too much stuff going on. So that gives us the advantage to jump in and take the deals. And that's mainly what the member side is about. So uh, it's interesting to note here that the sharpest player in the game, I would say, would be JM Bullion. 
And we'll do four nines on this one, I think, and they give you the number. So you can see there's 1,700 left at that price. Um, and then there's the same at Atmex for a couple bucks cheaper. And then there's this really cheap coin over here at Bullion Direct. So to sum it all up, I think the GOAT is about bottoming out now. The fact that Gainesville has run out, the fact that JM is taking the lead with raising prices, I think that probably it's time to do some bottom fishing on this GOAT series. Now, it's not a coin for me aesthetically, but then again, the rabbit wasn't a coin for me aesthetically, and that coin was a phenomenal performer. So you can't just go by aesthetics. You have to look at the fact that you're looking at only 300,000 coins in the entire world for the 6 billion people that live on this earth. So that's that's going to be the bottom line. How rare is the coin? So it's unfortunate now that uh, we're getting this huge rally here, but prices aren't changing that much. Um, maybe we'll get a dip down. Uh, I don't have the dry powder right now, but if I did, I would be going into this GOAT series right now. And we'll talk to you next time.